Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the M3 Market Update. My name is Melody Wright, and I do this show to help give context for the information that you're hearing out there regarding the residential and commercial real, real estate markets, as well as mortgage finance. Um, I've been doing this show uh, since April of last year, almost a year. I'll have to look and see <laughs> when my year anniversary is. Um, but a lot of you who have been following me since that time knows that my focus um, was on inventory and debunking the myth that there was no inventory out there. I wrote a Housing Wire article in January of 23, where I gave a whole bunch of themes um, and reasons why we thought there was an inventory shortage, but there wasn't. As 2023 unfolded, the new home builders really pushed their inventory out there, their, their programs, and they really sustain the housing market. And here we are now in 2024, which is an election year, and things are going to get very crazy. Uh, what we can definitely see is that the narrative machine is working overtime across uh, different data sets, across different vested interests. And so what the focus of this show will be um, until the election is really arming you with the tools uh, to read those headlines and then start asking the right questions. Um, because it is going to be very important uh, for the spin machine to be working at such in such a manner that uh, folks don't come to understand what's actually going on in housing. They don't understand that we have plenty of inventory. Um, and that, you know, what the problem right now is that the inventory is mispriced. Um, and so I used to focus at the end of each show, just calling out some of the increases in inventory listings for sale, listings for rent. Um, I'm going to retire that section of the show and just focus on giving you the information you need to um, unpack a lot of these headlines. Um, if you want the inventory updates, you can always find them in my sub stack. Uh, I will be doing a version of them there. I will also probably try to do a show once a month where by census region, um, I'm building a presentation that I can give to folks and take them through what's going on in each census region, etc. So it's not like I've stopped tracking inventory, but we've been very faithful We've, we've got a year of data underneath us, and so now it's really turning to analytics and forecasting um, so we can understand the path ahead, uh, not to try and you know make predictions necessarily, but just to give you a sense of the conditions right in front of you as well as the ones at the next exit ahead or you know, further into the future because I don't believe in predictions, but I do believe in path. Um, and right now, the path we're on could be very um, torturous for certain folks if they take on too much leverage. And so in reality, uh, whether you're an investor, whether you're a homeowner, I'm talking to all of you because your, the decisions that you make right now are going to be very important in the years to come. And what I'm really trying to do is give you as much information as possible to make the best decision for you. I can't tell you this channel is not investment advice. Um, I'm just here to arm you with information um, to bring the macro, uh, you know, and that's data on the global economy. That's data on unemployment with the micro, um, those local markets. And I can tell you back during the last crisis, we sat in the middle of those two places without an understanding of either. And we perpetually got it wrong. And I see that happening right now. I was just talking to someone else and they asked me, hey, you were around last time. Uh, was Were mainstream media, were, were the narratives like this, were people just completely unwilling to admit what was happening? And I said, absolutely, for the longest time. And you could even look at the same economists right now saying the same things that were also wrong. So, you know, just generally around inventory, I would like to say, it's, and the reason why I'm not going to spend as much time focusing on it is because uh, mainstream media is starting to wake up. There's enough information now that people can't make the same claims anymore uh, we just saw inventory increase year over year using Fred data, using Realtor.com data. Uh, same thing, in case you didn't know that, but year over year increase of 
percent, 23.54%, a month over month increase of 4.63%. Last year, that same period, month over month, there was a decrease in inventory of 2.90%. So not only we last year was a decrease from February to March, this year increase as well as those year over year numbers. Um, people cannot, uh, so we're, get, you know, there's still places, there are absolutely going to be places, especially in your higher luxury neighborhoods. Um, those folks are still transacting. Those folks in the top 10 or 20%, you know, they're feeling pretty good. They're looking at their stock portfolio and they've been feeling pretty good. Um, things have gotten a little rockier here. Uh, and, and I do believe that might continue, but, you know, for a minute there, people were feeling very NVIDIA cash fat. And so we definitely saw higher end out there transacting, which that then made home prices look like they were taking up a little bit. But what I asked everybody to do is please pay attention to those new home prices. They keep coming down. Um, and, and that is really our signal. If those start jumping up again, you know, let's have a different conversation, but we are in the selling se season. And so there's going to be some bumpy months here and there on prices, on inventory. Um, but, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that we are now kind of in a trend of uh, increasing inventory um, as well as increase in price reductions, which we're seeing, you know, in Florida, it is on full display. And so, with inventory numbers like that, I don't feel like I have to keep focusing on the specific cities that have those increases. So uh, I'm going to spend more time with you taking the headlines, taking the data results, and digging underneath them to give you a clearer picture as well as a weather report on the current conditions. So welcome back. Um, one story that I focused on uh, this week is around something going on in the mortgage industry. And many of you know that I fell into mortgage back in 2006. Uh, nobody actually goes into mortgage on purpose. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is a very interesting story. I think a lot of people might have just kind of glossed over it. But to me, this is an interesting story because it tells us what's um, you know, kind of the it, the narratives that are to come. And, and as we kind of talk about, this is an election year. And right now, um, affordable housing is on the top of everyone's mind as we are seeing huge increases in evictions, as we are starting to see default and default in FHA specifically over 10%. If you look at Black Knight, it's 10.5%. If you look at HUD, it's 11.7%. But guys, FHA, which is a much larger part of the market than it was historically, you've got double digit delinquencies. And these are your most vulnerable borrowers. And what, when you say this out loud to everybody, what they say is, um, well, it's not that much of the market. It is. Between FHA and VA, they have doubled. Uh, since 2009, as you had your private players pull back. And so they are 16% of outstanding mortgages right now. So this delinquency is significant, right? It's being hidden by uh, weighted average of bigger balance prime loans, bigger balance jumbo loans, but it's still happening and it's spreading to those prime loans. We just saw a very small seasonal catch up because of tax and bonus season, much smaller than last year. And so we're going to continue to see um, uh, delinquency and mortgages increase. I'm not talking about a foreclosure tsunami. You guys know that this this game has completely changed since the GFC. But the other thing to note is that everybody says, oh, they're going to get modified. They're going to get modified. But a, a lot of these loans, many of these borrowers have already hit the limit of the claim. So this default is happening, guys. Um, it's just not going to be a foreclosure tsunami, not right away. Uh, we probably won't see meaningful foreclosures for another 14 months, uh, but they're happening and, and they will be increasing over that time. It's just not going to be a primary driver, in my opinion, of price discovery. It will play a part, 
um, but that is farther into our future. Right now, what you're seeing are the investors coming under stress. And I'm not talking about just the institutionals. I'm talking about the mom and pops that bought 10, 15 properties, um, and now they need to access their cash. But you can't just access it like an ATM. Uh, if you tried to go refi and you were in distress, you might not qualify. You don't want that dinging your credit report. Um, it, you know, home, the lines of credits like they used to have back in the GFC don't really exist anymore where you actually did use an ATM card. Um, but then essentially your only option is to list it for sale. And it, you know, properties down in Florida sitting six to nine months, especially in that luxury niche. And so that can be impactful to people needing to access liquidity. And so thinking that you're super rich because you have equity, you need to really think that through and build in how much time you might need to access that equity if you're relying on it. Okay, so I focused on an obscure story in the substock this week because I see some big themes at play out there between the banks uh, our regulators and the non-banks. And so just a quick history lesson, um, you know, post the GFC, a lot of banks, they kind of stepped away from lending. They were encouraged to reduce their balance sheets. Additional requirements were put in place um, called the Supplementary Leverage Ratio, SLR, as well as new capital requirements. Um, part of Basel through the whole idea was that mortgages were riskier therefore you know if you were going to participate in mortgages you needed more capital if you were a bank if you were one of these globally systemic important institutions or gsibs well you know ultimately the banks just said mm, that's okay you guys can have it and they kind of step back and let the non-banks come in so for scale you can kind of think you know prior to the gfc non-banks were like roughly 10 to 15 percent of the market um, then you get post gfc and that just starts increasing you get to 2020 or that's around 68 percent well COVID happens and the fed realizes it you know it has to participate it's going to buy mortgage box securities it needs the banks to play they do a suspension of the leverage ratio all the way through 21 and you can see the banks started participating in mortgage again. And the non-bank share has just gotten uh, smaller and smaller because the banks have deposits in times of trouble. They can turn to those and to fund their origination. If you're a non-bank, you just have warehouse lines, um, liquidity facilities, and you're in a thin margin business where it's very important what you're paying interest and then what you're getting as interest from the borrower. And right now, that is a much harder game to make happen, especially with all the expense in servicing. And so the non-banks are, are struggling significantly. Well, the two that were in the news are our top at number one and two for FHA lending. Now, a lot of people remember FHA. They'll think first-time home buyers. That uh, program has gone off the reservation since uh, you know, kind of 2009, I would say that they, as they were trying to get housing, you know, restart the engine. That is when you pretty much try to give credit to everybody, and I believe that's where we are in the cycle right now. Um, but then they kept turning to those lower uh, income borrowers during you know post 2014 when things were really desperate, and we just saw you saw FHA delinquency just tick up quite a bit up into 2019, COVID essentially saved that play, meaning that if COVID forbearance programs had not come along, we would have had an FHA foreclosure crisis in 2020. And we were setting out that way. So what happens during COVID? You get all these programs um, with these benefits and we have forestalled it yet again. So you've got your top two originators of FHA loans, Rocket Mortgage and United Wholesale. And last week, there was a concerted attack on United Wholesale. Um, you had a story in ESPN about these two um, big mortgage players. You know, Dan Gilbert from Rocket, he owns the Cavaliers. Matt Ishbia from United, he owns the Suns. 
Uh, so ESPN did this whole expose that really didn't pat, uh, paint Matt in a great light, in my opinion. I think he looked worse for wear in the story. Later that afternoon, you got another breaking news story um, from a new media group backed by some journalists, um, well-known journalists, um, with a certain political affiliation, attacking United Wholesale for its its policies around um, someone called steering uh, they came out with an announcement a couple of years ago. That you can't work with Rocket or Fairway if you're going to work with United. Um, and so there's been multiple lawsuits, multiple claims over the years that United was not playing fair. Uh, but so this, I always ask myself when we finally see something like this, why this, why now? Well, as I dove into this media group, a couple of things. One, uh, you know, the person on the advisory board is Paul Steiger. I, when I was at the Wall Street Journal, he was the managing editor. He he sat a few doors down from where I sat. Uh, you know, I remember him specifically walking around the newsroom with his Dow Ten Thousand cap on and his Dow Ten Thousand shirt. He went on to uh, start ProPublica, um, but that organization came under scrutiny last summer um, for some questionable donations and, and really their objectivity was questioned. So that's one example of who is behind the media group. I would encourage you to go read it as well. I did a deep dive into both Rocket and United's financials just to do a comparison of where they are right now because although both had a really ugly year last year, um, I believe like Unite, looking at some things like servicer advances, Ginny Mae repurchases, that United is in worse shape. But I, I personally believe both of these companies are in for trouble because so many people pile into the Ginny Mae product because they see those upfront basis points when you deliver it to capital markets. It's a boost to your income statement. It's a boost to your gain on sale. And so <clears throat> that it everybody thinks awesome. The problem is once you start actually servicing these in default, you lose money hand over fist. The government acts like any other insurance company. When you go to turn around and you know file your claim, they give you a whole bunch of trouble um, if they pay it, and then you know you're so, you you have to wait for them to pay it. I remember some VA claims. I mean, taking years, three years to get paid, for instance. And so as mortgages liquidity gain game, if you take the liquidity out of the front end, which is that booking that gain on sale, and you're just left with all of these expenses on the back end, but you're not getting that liquidity in the door, then very quickly trouble emerges. And, and you know, these are very complicated relationships between the, the GSCs, between FHA, VA, the investors in the mortgage box securities. And this is a very hard game to play and there are not many people that can play it and I think that you know really uh, the powers that be have realized that um, especially as they went into COVID and the non-banks were getting into trouble especially as Yellen has been very visibly uh, you know talking about cracking down on the non-banks because they don't have emergency access to capital I think that the powers that be realize this stuff needs to go back to the banks um, as you know, and the banks want that as well, but they don't want those additional capital requirements. And I think that they are basically saying you don't want these inexperienced folks taking care of this. You need us here. And so there's a lot of vested interest at play, but I do think also this is going to become um, a political scapegoat goat uh, because everyone's looking around how did we get here how are homes so affordable surely it had nothing to do with what the fed did i mean that can't be it so let's look at nar let's look at um these institutional landlords let's look at uh these bad 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 broker united wholesale and let's look you know let's create our bad guys and i think that's what this is kind of the um, Obama 2.0 playbook, and I think a lot of you know I don't I I don't align with either party. I align with you, the forgotten American, and uh, that's who I care about. And and so, but that Obama playbook was you know pull out the servicers, make them the bad guys, give them a little fine, 
a whole bunch of news articles about it, give all these requirements, start a new agency. But in reality, um, nothing really changed. And and that is what, you know, I've had to come to understand uh, in the past, really the past 18 months, because when I went out on the road last year in February, I still did not think that there was an issue in mortgage just because I was one of the ones out there instituting all these programs to theoretically make it impossible. But as I think more about my experience, as I think about, you know, the fact that all these these automated underwriting systems are really keying, um, I have now realized that, yes, mortgage will suffer as well, will also be in trouble. It's just not going to be, and it never was the only driving factor of the GFC, but it's it's going to play a different part this time. Um, and it it's not going to be a leading role, at least I don't think so. Things could change, but I don't believe so. I think all those all cash sales and and those properties will play more of a leading role this time. Um, but we might, you know, in fairness, we will see those come out of the woodwork. They're not sitting at the banks and the non-banks like we think. These are private notes serviced by private individuals um, that are at some non-bank. So sorry, that's really confusing, but we may see mortgage in a very different way. And that's the unregulated mortgage market that comes, um, that so, that really shows the first signs of serious stress before we see the traditional mortgage market. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, we've now had subsequent news stories about, uh, you know, uh, Ishbia says Rocket was behind the attack. Rocket says, no, we weren't behind the attack, but we believe the report. And this is going to continue. But I believe that winners and losers are being set up, um, that we're going to have some, you know, some scapegoats uh, in folks like NAR. And I'm not saying they didn't deserve it, uh, but the reopening of that DOJ inv investigation, as well as I believe the DOJ is probably already investigating institutional landlords um, for excessive fees, for very similar things that happened during mortgage last time. People can't get in touch with anybody. They they talk to one person, explain everything. Then they talk to the next person. They have to explain it all again because the notes aren't there. These are typical things that were waged against the mortgage industry and you're hearing it about institutional landlords so i wouldn't be surprised if we don't have some sort of consent order for the institutional landlords and then i think the non-banks are going to um, perform pretty badly from here uh, both united and rocket had uh, borrowings coming due in 24 over two billion dollars so what terms they get will be very important. But I honestly think that when we're we're done with all of this and, you know, three to five years that the non-banks will not be playing the same role that they are today. And if that's not true, then things went really differently than where we are. <laughs> so we shall see and we'll keep watching it. Um, but so my the reason I focus on this story in the Substack and why I'm talking to you about it today is that I again I'm just going to repeat myself the the headlines are important and we should always ask ourselves why are we hearing this now and some would think oh it's just about the stock price I honestly think it's about a lot more than that and it's about lining up um, some really good scapegoats as these evictions um, and ultimately foreclosure shells, cells do move forward. So, okay, that's just a little bit of a, a story that I wanted to talk to you about. We'll be getting here in the next couple of weeks, existing home cells, new home cells, new home permits starts. I'll be doing shows around all of those. Uh, also, as soon as Redfin data is live, uh, which should be in a couple of days, I'll be able to to try and give a forecast for what I think those numbers are going to be. Um, but as always, you can reach me at M3 underscore Melody, M-E-L-O-D-Y on X Twitter, at M3 Melody Substack and M3 Melody YouTube. And I just want to say um, thank you guys for all the support out there. If, you know, if it weren't for you, uh, and knowing that you were out there every day, I would not be able to do this. So I just want to say thank you again. And I look forward to our journey. You know, I'm going to continue to be faithful. 
Um, I'm going to continue to do the hard work because I do think it's going to pay off in the end. So thanks for coming along with me on this journey. And I will talk to you guys soon. Thank you.